Welcome to World Medical School. My name is Mopoli Das, and I'm going to be talking to you today about an update in HIV prevention. It's a very pivotal time in HIV prevention. We've had some exciting results from many trials, which I'll be sharing with you today, but it's important to note that there is no single silver bullet. No one single prevention intervention can help end AIDS. Today, I'll be talking about an update in HIV prevention, and I'm going to cover what's new with our old tools, like condoms and syringes, and what's new, what are some new tools in our HIV prevention armamentarium. On the diagram on the right, you see this diagram of highly active HIV prevention and all the components that make up combination prevention approach, which seems to be the best way to approach HIV prevention in 2013. I'm gonna talk about some evidence for our new tools and how we've been doing and implementing those with respect to circumcision, pre-exposure prophylaxis, oral and topical methods, as well as treatment being used as prevention. So what's new with condoms? C is for condoms, according to Cookie Monster. Um, consistent condom use is the cornerstone of combination HIV prevention. There have been some new innovations lately with differences in design, as well as in new, uh, newly developed condoms for different modalities, such as the female condom and condoms for receptive anal intercourse. The Gates Initiative announced earlier this year that they're putting out $100,000 for the next generation condom that enhances pleasure, is culturally sensitive, and promotes regular, consistent use. And there are also novel structural approaches being used to distribute condoms. You see this condom dispenser in this rural area in the picture in the middle, as well as innovative approaches taken by different cities and jurisdictions to promote condom distribution in bars, clubs, restaurants, and places uh, where people meet people. Um, so there are a lot of new ways that we're using our old tool of condoms. What's new with syringes? Um, Syringe exchange and other harm reduction approaches are evidence-based approaches known to reduce HIV acquisition among injection drug users. However, because of political and other concerns, these approaches have not been uniformly implemented. In IAS 2013, the International AIDS Conference, which was held in Malaysia, uh, there were several reports about how a paradigm shift in the country of Malaysia from going towards zero tolerance for drug users and drug use to more of a harm reduction approach has made a significant impact. Malaysia has increased promotion of syringe exchanges, opioid substitution technologies, and replaced in injection drug use detention centers with voluntary rehab facilities. This has been noted with a uh, decline in HIV cases from about 35 100 reported each year in the early 2000s to 1,000 reported more recently. Uh, in summary, much of the results from the focus on drug use presentations at the International AIDS Conference this past summer noted that the war on drugs and the war on drug users has truly failed. The HIV epidemic, as well as other diseases like hepatitis B, C, and TB are increasing in areas of the world like the former, um, the countries in the former uh, Russian Republic, the Russian Federation countries, and in Eastern Europe. Uh, and in those areas, HIV uh, infections are driven by injection drug use and complicated by large scale incarceration, lack of access to opioid substitution therapies, lack of access to harm reduction services, and drug users are a particularly vulnerable population. What about circumcision? This is one of the newer tools in our armamentarium, although circumcision certainly is not a new thing. Over 40 observational studies have suggested an association between higher circumcision rates in certain countries in Africa and lower rates of HIV acquisition. Between 2005 and 2007, three randomized controlled trials demonstrated that voluntary male medical circumcision reduced HIV acquisition in heterosexual males by at least 60%. The number needed to treat is between five to 15 individuals. In other words, five to 15 circumcisions must be performed to eliminate one new case of HIV acquisition. In 2007, reviewing this evidence, the World Health Organization recommended voluntary male medical circumcision as a part of a combination HIV prevention treatment approach 
in regions that have high heterosexual epidemics, high rates of HIV, and low prevalence of circumcision. They identified 14 priority countries and said that up to 3.4 million HIV infections could be averted by 2025, which would save 16.5 billion US dollars if scale up was rapid and reached 80% of men between 15 to 49. What's the progress here? This uh, graph from AVAC shows a progress in scale up in the priority countries. And most recently at the International AIDS Conference this past summer, um, there were results from some of these countries that were shared, including the fact that in Zambia, the rate of prevalence of circumcision had increased from 10% to 20% in the last three years as a VMMC campaign had been implemented. There are certain challenges with scale-up, including safety monitoring, monitoring adverse events, challenges with evaluation and loss to follow-up uh, that remain part of uh, the implementation science agenda for figuring out the best way to scale up circumcision on a rapid scale. One of the things that has been explored uh, in terms of improving scale up of circumcision has been looking at different ways, including reducing surgical time and the requirement for sophisticated surgical techniques to scale up uh, circumcision in different countries. In 2013, the World Health Organization endorsed these two new devices, including the Shang Ring and the Prepex device, which um, are designed to reduce the amount of time and the level of surf surgical expertise required to conduct circumcisions. And these devices have been studied and associated with limited adverse events um, and decreased uh, requirements for surgical uh, specialty expertise, although they are both associated with a longer healing period as no sutures are used. What about pre-exposure prophylaxis? Pre-exposure prophylaxis is a novel biomedical prevention intervention that's rapidly becoming part of the combination HIV prevention approach. There have been several successful trials for pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is defined as taking uh, either orally or applying topically a um, HIV medication in an HIV negative purpose for the purposes of preventing acquisition of HIV, similar to the way the birth control pill may be used to prevent the acquisition of pregnancy. So the first results that were very exciting were announced at the International AIDS Conference in July of 2010, and that was a Caprice study, which demonstrated a 39% efficacy in a product of a 1% tenofovir vaginal gel that was used 12 hours before and 12 hours after intercourse. And this, the population studied was uh, women with this vaginal gel. The next set of results came with IPREX, which was an extremely groundbreaking study that showed daily oral Truvada, or the tenofovir FTC formulation, reduced uh, acquisition of HIV among high-risk MSM and transgender women who have sex with men by 42%. Partners in PrEP and tenofovir 2 uh, followed in July of 2001 um, with partners in PrEP examining both oral tenofovir alone as well as the combination in heterosexual discordant couples. Similarly, tenofovir, the TDF2 study conducted in Botswana looked at men and women with uh, higher rates of efficacy in these groups between 60 and 75%. Um, most recently, at IAS and earlier this summer, the results of the Bangkok Nafavir study were announced. This study has been ongoing since February, uh, sorry, since the year 2005, and examined oral tenofovir in injection drug users and found an efficacy of reducing acquisition of HIV of 49%. In all of these studies, it's important to note that where drug levels have been done, the efficacy is significantly higher among those people who were adherent to the study medication and had serum drug levels indicating good adherence. In those situations, the efficacy rates are much higher among the people who actually took the medication. Where did PrEP not work? There was no efficacy demonstrated in the following two trials, which took place among high-risk young women in Africa. Uh, the FEMPREP study and the VOICE study were both very disappointing studies in that they were stopped early for no efficacy. The FEMPREP study was looking at oral Truvada in women, and the VOICE study looked at oral tenofovir, oral TDF-FTC, and the 1% vaginal gel, and both of these studies were stopped by their DSMB for no efficacy. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about why um, this 
why PrEP did not work in these particular studies, uh, because the self-reported adherence rates were extremely high. However, when drug levels were done, they were low, and there were high rates of HIV incidence as well as pregnancy in both arms, indicating uh, that these women were highly sexually active and um, not adhering to using condoms or the uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis in the studies, despite reporting using the medication and rep uh, returning um, uh, uh, used uh, gel containers. Basically, the bottom line appears to be that pre-exposure prophylaxis, like antiretroviral therapy, only works if you take it consistently and as recommended. So what is the implementation progress for pre-exposure prophylaxis? This slide just demonstrates graphically that you have, uh, after each study has come out, different groups have issued interim guidance on the use of pre-exposure prophylaxis in those populations. Right now, the United States is the only country where the FDA or uh, the drug uh, advisory board has approved Truvada for the indication of pre-exposure prophylaxis. The World Health Organization has issued recommendations on how to use pre-exposure prophylaxis in demonstration projects throughout the world. What are some remaining questions that we need to struggle with before we fully uh, scale up PrEP in our combination prevention interventions? First of all, we need to figure out what is the optimal drug. The original studies have been done with tenofovir as well as tenofovir combined with FTC. Uh, a future study coming up, HPTN069, will look at combinations also involving Maraviroc. Um, there are possibilities for using long-acting intramuscular monthly dosing options, such as dolutegravir uh, formulated in nanoparticles, which could be injected once a month, which may help address some of the adherence issues. There's also concerns about what is the optimal dosing pattern. Should it be daily? Should it be time-based? Should it be event-based, for example, associated pre or post uh, exposure prophylaxis? Um, what is the optimal delivery modality? Uh, in this case, um, there's different ways to, uh, for application, including um, a study in, with the microbicides trials network that's going to look at a 1% tenofovir rectal gel. There's also vaginal rings as well as combination vaginal rings. The first product studied has been depivirine, and a second product will be a depivirine maraviroc combination for vaginal ring. How will this work in real life? Demonstration projects are taking place across the United States as well as in different countries to look at different ways to use, uh, different ways to deliver pre exposure prophylaxis in real life among different populations in combination with other prevention interventions, for example, as a bridge to ART in heterosexual discordant couples, um, as well as with adherence interventions, uh, including texting and other novel ways to promote adherence, which has been a challenge in some of the pre exposure randomized clinical trials. So, our last modality that we're going to talk about that's made a big impact in combination prevention interventions is really the concept that's sometimes referred to as treatment as prevention, but I prefer saying treatment is prevention. So the big news with this was the HPTN052 study, which studied uh, early antiretroviral therapy in positive uh, individuals in serodiscordant couples and found that treatment of the positive partner reduced transmission by 96% which is a tremendously high rate of efficacy and higher than any of the other interventions that we've discussed so far today. So what's the latest evidence? Um, there's been three studies from the most recent International AIDS Conference that I'd like to highlight. First of all, the Temprano ANRS study um, with the French group in Côte d'Ivoire and Abidjan looked at about 1,000 people and they either started immediately after diagnosis or per the standard guidelines of the country. Um, the reductions in sexual risk behavior were similar in both arms, and the protective effect of early antiretroviral therapy was modeled to be about 90% uh, in this study. Uh, the partners in PrEP study that I referred to earlier in terms of the pre-exposure prophylaxis study, um, the positive partners in this study were looked at, those who had higher CD4 counts and those who, had, who were users of alcohol were much more likely to delay ART initiation even when offered ART initiation through the study. Uh, there were some provider level ba barriers, including pre-ART processing times and repeating CD4 counts. 
uh, that were associated with delayed initiation, and there were also concerns about stigma. The stigma work was followed up by a qualitative uh, study nested within the Botswana Treatment as Prevention Study that identified the following barriers to initiating antiretroviral therapy for the purposes of prevention or earlier ART initiation. Barriers identified included stigma, disclosure and shame, concern about side effects, the fact that once ART can, is started, it cannot be stopped, and the fact that ART cannot be taken along with alcohol or traditional medicines, which is not necessarily correct with respect to alcohol. ART can be taken with alcohol, but this was a concern that folks in Botswana had. Facilitators promoting earlier initiation of ART included the desire for improved health and knowing um, an adherent person who was on antiretroviral therapy who got better and felt better. So these are important qualitative research uh, factors that have been demonstrated that should be taken into account as we think about ways to improve uptake of earlier antiretroviral therapy um, in different contexts throughout the world. Implementation progress. So earlier use of antiretroviral therapy has been recommended in jurisdictions across the United States starting in San Francisco in 2010 as well as in New York in 2011 and with both sets of uh, US guidelines in the United States from 2012 to 2013 promoting antiretroviral therapy regardless of CD4 count. These recommendations, particularly made in San Francisco in advance of the HPTN052 study, were made for the increasing evidence that earlier initiation of ART at higher CD4 counts uh, is better for individual health. It certainly has a substantial collateral benefit of reducing transmission and possibly having an impact on reducing transmission for the rest of the epidemic. Uh, the World Health Organization announced earlier this summer in June of 2013 that they are changing their guidelines from less than 350 to less than 500, but they have not made the step or leap to recommend antiretroviral therapy for all individuals who are using, who are HIV positive, regardless of CD4 count. So, Going back to basic epidemiology as we conclude this lecture and we think about the impact of combination HIV prevention interventions, prevalence has historically been defined as the incidence of disease times the duration of disease. But what we have seen from the results of HPTN 052 and numerous observational studies before then is that prevalence in terms of driving the epidemic, it's no longer about prevalence. It's about prevalent viremia. So in the old days, we had the idea of the prevalence bathtub. The only way to get into being in, a, in the prevalent bathtub was by incidence. The only way out was death. But now, if you are HIV positive but undetectable, you're 96% less likely to transmit. And this has really changed our understanding of epidemic dynamics. And really, it's not about prevalence anymore driving new infections. It's about prevalent viremia. In terms of the United States, despite having all of this excellent evidence about the importance of earlier testing, linkage to care, diagnosis, and prompt initiation of ART and achieving virologic suppression, uh, nationwide and in San Francisco, we're not where we'd like to be with about 20 to 40 percent of all positive individuals living in these jurisdictions having virologic suppression, which is the ideal outcome of antiretroviral treatment for their own individual health benefit, as well as for the prevention of passing on new infections. There's some outstanding questions that remain with treatment as prevention. Uh, concerns have been raised about risk behavior increasing among individuals taking antiretroviral therapy, the idea of risk compensation or decompensation, a meta-analysis uh, reported at the most recent uh, AIDS conference uh, with an N of 30,000 individuals showed that people who were on ART were actually 28% less likely to report unprotected sex uh, than people who weren't taking treatment. And they were also less likely, 43% less likely to report unprotected sex with an unknown or seronegative uh, HIV status partner. There are concerns about the correlation between serum viral loads with undetectable uh, semen viral loads. If someone is undetectable in their blood, does that necessarily mean that they're undetectable in their semen? 
Uh, on balance, most people who are undetectable in their blood are undetectable in their semen, but there are uh, blips and inconsistencies and lack of correlation, and some of these studies were reported at the most recent AIDS conference. Most importantly, as we think about scaling up all of the inf interventions that I've discussed in our prevention armamentarium today, the real important questions to consider are the practicalities of implementing earlier treatment while ensuring treatment access for those who need it, the practicalities of which aspects of combination HIV prevention are most important for, with respect to the epidemiology in the local jurisdiction, and how to do all of this while strengthening the healthcare infrastructure in these places. There's numerous, numerous ongoing studies that are cluster randomized controlled trials or other approaches informed by implementation science that are looking at the most evaluate, to evaluate the most effective way to do this in real life. In conclusion, it's an extremely exciting time in the field of HIV for prevention science, particularly with respect to our new ways of combining these medications and approaches and interventions together in combination prevention. However, I would like to end with this quote by Diane Havler and Chris Bearer. It would be an extraordinary failure of global will and conscience if financial constraints and false dichotomies, such as divergences between prevention and treatment, truncate our ability to begin to end AIDS just when the science is showing that this goal is achievable. Thank you very much for attending this World Medical School lecture.